Greetings, students, and uh, welcome to your hybrid session for uh, ladies and gentlemen of the gas chamber and the American school. There's our two titles, and there are our authors. Both of them are dealing with the fallout from World War II. For Borofsky, that is a lifetime spent in various detainment camps, and for Kojima, that's the American occupation of Japan. Both work with the politics of different languages. We'll see in Borofsky that in the concentration camp, a mixture of European languages is spoken to facilitate the work of the Kapos. For Kojima, speaking and teaching English is a fraught enterprise. You'll see a range of attitudes toward this, from Yamada, who wants to please the occupiers, to Isa, who just wants to keep himself out of trouble. We'll also see this question of ambiguity in the contact zone. This is the idea that once a certain limit of humanity is passed, the differentiation between tormentor and victim becomes fluid. You'll see in Borofsky's story that fellow inmates become a part of the system of torture in the concentration camp. For Kojima, we'll see that resistance and persecution can be highly personalized in the character of Isa. So we've got a few literary concepts here. Uh, the first is what I'm calling transcultural communication. This class presumes that it's possible and desirable to communicate across cultures. That's why we assign these texts from all over the world. Today's readings are going to challenge those assumptions in a number of ways. As you read both these texts, be sure to think about where you see communication and where you see the failure of communication based in cultural difference. Kojima, in particular, will repeatedly present an English phrase that Issa tries to use with an American soldier. We'll have to consider what kind of non-communication is happening there. We'll, we'll also talk about depersonalization. Uh, we'll see that the stakes of representation are very high for writers like Borofsky. When your subject matter is the Holocaust, getting it right is very important. One might think that means adopting an objective point of view is the surest approach, but I think we'll see that objectivity is simply not possible once you're in the camps. As a result, Borowski gives us a strongly subjective perspective on the camp, but that perspective often refuses its own humanity. I wouldn't say that he's trying to minimize the narrator's role in the atrocities that are happening, but he's recording the evaporation of the humanity of these characters. So, and uh, here in a minute when we talk about close reading, I'll return to this idea and show you how this actually happens in language. Uh, ironic distance is sort of related to this idea of depersonalization. So, <coughs> Kojima does something kind of similar, but uh, in a more gentle way. Ironic distance is the space between the author, narrator, character, and or reader. And let me tell you what I mean by that. There are times when we read and we feel like we are absolutely plunged into the consciousness of the narrator. So, for instance, in somnambulism, there are moments when we feel like we have no choice but to go with what young Althorpe is thinking. So there's, there's basically like no distance between us and him. We get that distance back, though. The text gives it back to us at another point. There are other times when we feel like we have a space between ourselves and the characters. So, for instance, in Child's Play, the narrator establishes herself as someone who knows more about the setting and the characters than we do as readers. And that lets her present them to us, uh, the characters and the setting, that lets her present those things to us as she wishes, without us having to be completely wrapped up in their drama. In today's reading, Kojima is going to give us the distance we need to laugh at Yamada, while also allowing us to realize he's probably a war criminal. We can laugh at Isa in some instances, but we'll also get to be on his side in others. So Kojima is a real master of manipulating this ironic distance. Historical context are really important for us today. <coughs> for the American school, uh, we're talking about the American occupation of Japan after the war. So this is from 1945 to 1952. It's part of the larger settlement after World War II. Its goals were disarmament, uh, liberalization or democratization, and education reform. Also during this time, there was a purge of war criminals, which we might see reflected in our text. That's something to keep an eye out for. 
Uh, and Japan was also partially deindustrialized at this time. So the, the post-war period was a major sort of um, re-examination of, of Japanese identity. Uh, the impact of the surrender is, is it's kind of hard to overestimate. The Japanese were told throughout the war that they were having great success and that victory was imminent, really all the way up to the end. So the surrender came as a huge shock. Uh, things were already going very badly in Japan, though. There were food shortages. Obviously, many cities were destroyed. Uh, trade was uh, not doing what it needed to. There was widespread exhaustion and despair throughout the country. Uh, and those are things that you might see reflected as you read the American school. So keep an eye out for that. The idea that we're really dealing with a group of people who is thoroughly defeated, uh, who have not had enough to eat, and not had the kind of opportunities that they would have normally had in their lives. For Borowski, historical context, uh, it's interesting thinking about his, his life. So his parents were both imprisoned for political reasons. Borowski himself was sent to a concentration camp for publishing poems in Polish. <coughs> he wasn't trying to take a side or make some big political statement in his poetry. He just wanted to publish poems, and that was enough to get him uh, moved to a concentration camp. In fact, it's, it's Auschwitz is, is where he is, uh, where he was and where the story is set. At the end of the war, when the camps were liberated, he was moved to a camp for displaced people. So, another camp. Uh, after the war, he joined up with communists, thinking that this was a revolution that could prevent the atrocities he's seen before. On learning about Soviet prison camps and political purges in Poland, he saw himself as part, once again, of the camp system, and he actually uh, committed suicide by sticking his head in a gas oven. So the concentration camp uh, of one sort or another kind of uh, colored his whole life. I kept, I've, I've been saying that we would get to Borowski on hope, and here's what he had to say about it. And this is going to be really central to the story, particularly for this uh, beautiful blonde woman who shows up in the middle of the story. Anyway, here's what he had to say. It's a quote. It is hope that breaks down family ties, makes mothers renounce their children or wives, sell their bodies for bread or husbands kill. It is hope that compels man to hold on to one more day of life, because that day may be the day of liberation. Ah, and not even the hope for a different, better world, but simply for life, a life of peace and rest. Never before in the history of mankind has hope been stronger than man, but never also has it done so much harm as it has in this war, in this concentration camp. We were never taught how to give up hope, and that is why today we perish in gas chambers. Maybe it's a different message than you're expecting on hope. And, and I hope that, uh, that the story, uh, Borowski's story, is a little different than what you expect from a story of a concentration camp. So let's move on to some close reading evidence. We have a couple passages here. Let's look at this one. Here's a passage from the American School. And um, this passage is going to illustrate that kind of ironic distance that, that we were talking about before. So what do we have? Michiko slackened her pace and walked silently at Issa's side as if to subdue his pain by force of her own calm will. Until now she had found him a tedious companion, thoroughly wrapped up in himself for no apparent reason. But as soon as she began to share in his suffering, faint memories stirred within her of the love, long forgotten, that a woman can also share with a man. She did not, however, lose sight of her objective. She meant to have from him that homely article left being uh, in, her in her haste. What love she felt for him was bound up with her hopes of getting it, and seemed to emanate like hunger pangs from somewhere near the pit of her empty stomach. So here we see Michiko's dawning love for Issa, while also seeing that she has an objective. I want you to pay particular attention to this euphemism, homely article. You'll see it come up repeatedly in the text. In fact, the revelation of what it really is kind of drives the story to a climactic moment at which uh, Michiko falls off her high heels. So keep an eye out for references to that homely article as you read. The passage ties together the starvation that many Japanese people felt during the occupation, the return of love, and a certain culturally important item in a way that establishes uh, the importance of all of that 
without um, overdoing it. So it's, it's a pretty impressive passage. Let's move over here to a passage from Borowski. <coughs> this is from the very beginning of his text. Let's try to pay attention to the ways in which prisoners are denied their humanity. The whole camp went about naked. True, we had already passed through the delousing process and received our clothing back. 28,000 women had been stripped and turned out of the blocks. They could be seen right now scrambling on the meadows, roads, and roll-call grounds. The morning is spent in waiting for dinner. Contents of food parcels are being eaten. Friends visited. The hours pass slowly as they do in extreme heat. So in that first sentence, the whole camp is a metonymy for the prisoners of the camp. So we're avoiding talking about the people. In the second sentence, 28,000 women, that sentence, we slip into the passive voice. That means the objects of the verb receive the action, leaving subjects out altogether. So 28,000 women had been stripped and turned out of the blocks. We don't know by whom. They could be seen right now. We don't know who's seeing them, but they could be seen. There's a similar construction in the next sentence. We don't know exactly who's spending the morning waiting for dinner, uh, eating and visiting, but we do know that those activities happen. These are examples of the kind of depersonalization to which I referred earlier. I don't think Borowski is dodging responsibility. I think he's trying to report to us what happens when you lose yourself in a situation that's this big and this bad. So some things to keep in mind while you read. How much space is there between you and the characters and the world they inhabit? And where does that change? Um, I think you'll find this shifts continuously throughout both these stories. And, and that it's, uh, it needs to be carefully managed for them to have the effect that they do. As you're reading uh, Borowski's text, think about what literary and linguistic tactics dehumanize the suffering represented in the text. Uh, you might think, what resources does Borowski use to get away from something that's just absolutely overwhelming? And then as you're reading Kojima, as you're reading The American School, think about how the characters are defined by objects. And also make sure to pay attention to that passage where Michiko falls off her uh, high heels. And we'll try to come up with an answer to this question, why does she fall at the end of the story? Okay. So that's it, a quick look at two texts tracing some effects of World War II in literature. I'll see you in class for our next session. Thanks.